It is a beautiful day outside, isn't it? Uh, I was standing out there with Kenton and just chatting earlier, uh, enjoying the glimpse of spring. I don't trust this weather uh, too much. I wouldn't invest in it if I were you. Uh, if it were a stock, I would say stay away from that stock. <laughs> um, but we'll enjoy it uh, nonetheless. It's a wonderful Sabbath, uh, but at the same time, it's a heavy Sabbath for some of us. Uh, we look around the world today and we see a lot of destruction, a lot of despair. Uh, with what's happened in Australia for the past couple of weeks, uh, with the, the bushfires that have consumed uh, almost the entirety of the continent there. Um, and a lot of uh, destruction to the lands um, and a lot of destruction to the wildlife. So we have to continue to pray and to act uh, on their behalf. Uh, this morning, uh, for my family, it's a little uh, burdensome as well to come and worship while thinking of our family in Puerto Rico. Um, if you don't know, for the past 10 days, they've had over 300 earthquakes. Over 300. Uh, just this morning, uh, they were hit with uh, 6.0, uh, uh, 6.5 uh, a couple days ago. And so there's a lot of destruction. They're still uh, recovering from the hurricane uh, just two years ago. So we got to keep them in prayers as we worship today, as we come uh, seeking God's face. So if you have your, your Bible with you, uh, I'd like to, to open to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Uh, if you know me, you'll find out pretty quickly that the Gospel of John is my favorite book. And in all the Bible, the book of John is perhaps my favorite uh, narrative of the Gospel. John, um, if you don't know, uh, John eventually left the island of Patmos. John did not die at Patmos. He was exiled there, but eventually he left. And after he leaves, uh, he writes this magnificent, magnificent um, picture of Jesus, the Gospel of John. Uh, and there he, he does something very beautiful. Uh, John chapter 6, verses 15 to 21. John chapter 6, verses 15 to 21, and we're going to read through this. Uh, and it says, Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and went over the sea toward where? Capernaum. And it was already dark. And Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat. And they were afraid. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. Pray with me. Father of creation, Lord of heaven, we come this morning seeking your face. Father, as we open up your word, as we have read through the scriptures, we pray that Jesus can be lifted, that the truths you have here in your word can make a difference in our lives today. May we be transformed to your image. May we be given hope for a new day. Wisdom to please you. Courage to take the gospel to the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. John chapter 6 is a, is a special chapter in the book of John because it is a time where the Jews are about to celebrate Passover. 
If you read verse 4 in John chapter 6, Passover is on their mind. Passover is coming up. So what are they thinking about? The Jews are recalling the story of the Exodus, where Jews, uh, the, the people of Israel, escape uh, through the power of God's hand from Egypt, and they are headed into uh, the new promised land of Canaan. And there they are reminded of the sacrificial lamb that was uh, taken, the blood, and posted on every doorpost, uh, on, on every home of those who would leave Egypt and go into Canaan. So this is a time where the Jews are remembering these things and they are consecrating their hearts to God, planning their trip to Jerusalem to celebrate. And there, on the road, Jesus is confronted with thousands of people seeking healing, seeking a word from the master, seeking some wisdom from the teacher of Galilee. Here he is, face to face, there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus and thousands. The text says, that after Jesus had preached and teached and healed, he asked a question. How are these folk going to eat? What have they brought? Some said, Master, do you know how much it's going to cost if we, we go out with our credit cards? You know, the teacher, I, I don't know, I might get dra uh, overdraft fee on, on my card. Teacher, I, I didn't get paid this week. It's not till next week. Jesus looks at them and says, don't worry. Now, there was one of the disciples, Andrew. Andrew, in, in, in the Gospels, he's known for bringing people to Jesus. He's, he's Peter's brother. He finds a boy and says, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? Now, we know what happens next. Jesus makes the people sit down. They're in groups. They're in the grass. And, and the text says that Jesus uh, uh, had them be counted. And it, 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 it says that there were 5,000 men present. Now, forgive me, ladies, that the text does not include the count of women. <laughs> you, you'll have to talk to John when we get to heaven. Uh, and tell him, why did you leave us out? But understanding the culture of their time, understanding why they would overlook the women, you must assume that there were women present. There were children present. So I need you to know that 5,000 bellies were not filled that day. If you can imagine uh, there were men there, and if you could say maybe one woman per man, 5,000 men plus 5,000 women, how much does that bring? About 10,000. If there were children there, we know there, were, there was a lad that brought his lunch with him to the gathering. If there were children there, perhaps 14, 15, 16,000 mouths were fed. This is a miracle that none have seen before. You see, the Jews were, were looking for the Messiah that they had envisioned. The Messiah who would break the chains of oppression. The Messiah who would liberate them from the rule of the Roman Empire. And here comes a man a teacher from Galilee that could feed with just a few loaves and a few fish an entire army of people. Not just that, this man is told to even have the power to raise the dead back to life. Oh, what kind of captain for the armies of Israel, this man would be. The, the military capabilities he possesses to feed armies, to revive them, all by the power of his hand. 
So you can imagine the thinking of the people. You can imagine the thinking of the disciples themselves. We got to crown this guy as king immediately. You see, the disciples did not have this romanticized connection we often think of to Jesus. You see, there are some people that do good things with bad intentions. In fact, we know that the disciples were confused why Jesus would always tell them to not share the news of a healing, to not share the news of him bringing someone uh, back from the dead. The disciples were confused, often confused, with Jesus' mission on earth. The disciples wanted to crown Jesus as king, not to exalt him and honor him because he deserved it, but because in doing so, it would exalt themselves. It would put them in a position of society that was higher than the one they possessed before. You see, some people today worship God not because of who he is, but because of what he does. Some of us today are more interested in the blessing than the blessing giver. Some of us are more interested in what we receive than who we worship. You see, it is a dangerous act to come before God only because of what we could obtain. God does not owe us anything, church. God is God. He is sovereign. And we are his people. See, the disciples, they said, we have a goal in mind. We want Jesus to be king. How many of us know that many of our goals go unreached? I know some of us today have our New Year list ready. We're, we're marking off the days. Uh, how many times we comply with those goals in mind? How many times a week we go to run because we want to get the, you know, the six-pack abs before summer comes? The beach body. <laughs> we perhaps are trying to obtain financial stability, so we're going on you know, a fast from shopping, right? Shopping for things that we don't need. Perhaps you have created a list of resolutions you would like to achieve this year. You need to know failure is in the DNA of humanity. In fact, a study done by Strava, so Strava typically uh, studies uh, professional athletes, a study done by Strava says that by January 12th, hello, tomorrow, most people who made resolutions for the new year quit by January 12th. So we've got 24 hours to enjoy the, the discipline we, we have set ourselves upon. But maybe you don't like that study. You say, Pastor, I don't know what sample size those sociolo uh, sociologists took, those researchers took for, for that study. I'll give you another one. Forbes did a study. And by February 14, Forbes found that 70% of all resolutions are either amended or abandoned altogether. What happens, church, when we experience setbacks to our goals? What happens, church, when we experience failure? When that which we thought was something worthy to obtain is amended by God or just put aside altogether. You see, the disciples, they had their plan. They decided, they had this vision they thought would be possible to roll out. And when the time came where they were ready to put the crown on Jesus' head, Jesus said, hold up. That's not what I'm here for. Resolutions, lists, Goals all waste them to the garbage. 
Our text tells us something about failure. Failure, like I said, is in the DNA of every human being, including Christians. We face setbacks. We face failure. How then do we move into 2020, continue in this year, knowing we will fail? How can we survive the new year knowing there will be obstacles in the way? I believe that this story in John, those verses we read, 15 and 21, contains six truths. How many truths? Six truths for surviving the new year. So, six truths. Number one, the text tells us that while the disciples entered into the boat to head to Capernaum, Jesus departed again to the mountain by himself alone. You see, when in our moments of despair, in our moments of setback, of error, Jesus is advocating on our behalf. See, I love the way Auntie Ellen puts it in The Desire of Ages as she comments on this story. She talks about Jesus presenting the disciples to the Father as they were out on the Sea of Galilee, praying that in the storm they would receive some clarity. They would receive the spirit to, to move their hearts, to show them why Jesus was there on earth. You see, in our failures, Jesus is in a mountain top. Jesus, the high priest, he's in Zion. Jesus, the king of kings, is advocating, praying on our behalf. What a thought. What does that teach us? as Christians, as we move forward in this new year, as we move forward trying to accomplish the goals that we have set, knowing that failure is a possibility, it means we too must take time to go to the mountaintop alone. One of my favorite songs, Psalms 46, tells us, be still and know that I am God. It's, it's very hard to be still in a capitalist world. In a society that places value on production. A society that tells you, you are worthy if you can get X amount of results. But the Bible tells us that God himself puts into our agenda a time and a day for rest. We do not rest so that we can work. We work so that we can rest. And, and Jesus often departed after the sermon. He often departed after the healing. He often departed after the miracle. Why? Because he knew there was moments and, and, uh, of time that he needed to depart and rejuvenate himself with God. Recalibrate his mind. Recalibrate his spirit. Plan into your agenda moments of rest. Don't just stretch yourself as far as you can go. Plan into your time moments where you can be still and just be aware of God's presence. Going forward into the new year, this story teaches us that we must be intentional about seeking God's presence. But the text continues and tells us that something happens while they're on the sea. If we know that the, the sea arose because of a great wind. Now, if, if you're unfamiliar with the Sea of Galilee, it's a, it's a small uh, uh, body of water. Uh, they call it a sea in scripture. Most of us would probably call it a lake. 
This is not a, a, a massive, now I, I studied at Andrews University, and we know what lakes look like. You see right next to Varian Springs is Lake Michigan. And if you've ever been to Michigan before, you'll see that Lake Michigan is more like an ocean. You can't see the other side. But the Sea of Galilee is much smaller. However, because it's small, doesn't mean storms don't happen. You see, this lake rests in the middle of mountain tops. And, and the, the, the hills and the valleys cause a lot of wind to come. And when the wind comes down from the mountains, through the valleys, uh, over the hills, it comes over the sea and causes a lot of storms. Strong winds occur over this small little lake. And the text says that they were on the sea when the storm arose. And verse 19 tells us, when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea. Now, I know that it takes quite a number of, a, a quite amount of strength to run a mile under five minutes. Now, your pastor, he loves running. Uh, I know that the world record for the mile is just under four minutes. I don't know what Jesus' physique looked like. I don't know if he was an athlete or not, but the text says after they had rowed about three or four miles in, Jesus, having been on the mountaintop, caught up to them. But notice, don't let the miracle of distance and uh, speed distract you from what's happening in the text. The text says that the storm was going on, yet Jesus was on the sea. One of the, the truths that can change your perspective for the new year is that in the storm, Jesus is there. In the storm, during the difficulty, during the distress, the obstacles you face as family members, the, the stress that you face in your marriage, the financial instability, in the storm, Jesus is there. He is present. He moves before you, behind you, and next to you. Adversity becomes easier when we know who is fighting our battles. But I, I need you to know that Jesus is not just in the storm. Look at the text. What does it say? They saw Jesus in another boat? Well, they saw Jesus walking on the sea. What does that let you know about Jesus? He is not just in the storm, but he has power over the storm. Jesus is in our storm and has power over our storms. The difficulties we face as individuals, as families, can become easier, can become lighter when we realize who is present in our storm. The master, the Lord of creation. He who can control the wind and the sea. Remember that text in, in Mark where, where the disciples are in the boat and Jesus is sleeping and they decide to wake Jesus up because they think because Jesus is sleeping and the storm is going on, he must be out of control. Yeah, right. They wake him up and, and he, he, he tells the sea to be still and then they marvel, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? This is he, Jesus, walking on the sea, displaying power and authority over that which disturbs us, that which rocks the boat, that which makes us uncomfortable. Jesus is there. Amen. The third 
third truth we must take into the new year. This truth that will help us handle failure and overcome adversity. The text tells us that the disciples, when they got into the boat, they set sail toward where? Toward Capernaum. You see, the disciples knew where they were going. With all the, the deficiencies and the imperfections that they had, the disciples were sure about the plan they needed to fulfill. They were going over the Sea of Galilee, coming from the, the, the land of uh, Bethesda, leaving, going from the east side of Galilee to the west side of Galilee to Capernaum. They're crossing the sea. They knew where they were going. Now, we talked about this on Wednesday. Evangelism doesn't happen by accident. We there in, in John chapter 4, uh, a few chapters before this, we saw Jesus going to Galilee, but there in the text it says he had to go through Samaria first. You see, if there's anything we can do as Christians, it is to know where we, were, we are going, to have a plan. You see, I'm a little concerned about people who approach the new year with no goals in mind with no plans for growth, with no plans for self-development. You see, someone said once, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. You see, this is how, this is how Ellen White says it. Let, 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 me, let me give it to you this way. In, um, in her writings, she says, Remember, you will never reach a higher standard than you yourself set. Many whom God has qualified to do excellent work accomplish very little because they attempt little. Christ Object Lessons, 331 to 332. The disciples had a plan. They knew where they were going. So church, where are you going? What is your plan as individuals? You want to have a more stable family. What's the goal? What's the plan? How are you going to get there? What's the strategy? What's, what's the move? We're not improvising. You see, we don't set sail without a destination in mind. Because that would mean we would be drifting. But God doesn't want a church that drifts. He wants a church that moves forward and knows where it's going. He wants families that move forward and know where they are going. He wants uh, marriages that move forward and know where they are going. The disciples knew they had a destination in mind. And where were they going? Capernaum. We'll get back to that. But the fourth truth of this story is that we can accomplish very little without Jesus inside of the boat. You see, the text says, as they rode about three, four miles, and were afraid, Jesus told them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat. You see, when you read it, in English, you just see willingly receive. But in the Greek, this is very special because willingly receive is related to the words of people who commandeer by force. Someone who comes in and, and takes without asking. Takes and, and takes control over. You see, Jesus needs to be in the boat, but Jesus needs to be in control of the boat. Amen. How many of us are willing to sacrifice our self-autonomy for Jesus? Amen. Let me put it this way. Who captains your ship? Who has the final say in your life? 
I'm a little weary of Christians who drive around with their nice little bumper sticker that says, Jesus is my co-captain. Well, if Jesus is your co-captain, <laughs> who's driving? <laughs> who's the captain? I'm a little weary of Christians who are willing to have Jesus in the boat, but not willing to have Jesus be in control. You see, it is not enough that Jesus be in the building. Jesus has to be at the head and everyone else at the bottom. Amen. Jesus must be in control. Jesus must be in control for the family who is losing hope. Jesus must be in control for the single mother who is trying hard. But can't get it out. Jesus must be in control for the marriages that are on the brink of divorce. Jesus must be in control. They willingly received him. This is an authorized hijacking. This is saying, Jesus, you can take control from here. But the next truth tells us that Jesus doesn't just need to be in the boat. Jesus doesn't just need to be in control of the boat, but the disciples must display trust towards God's word. You see, the text says, but he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. This, this verse there, it is I, do not be afraid. In the Greek, the, the translation would be ego in me. Now this phrase, ego in me, is, is used often by Jesus in the Gospels, especially when the Pharisees are interrogating Jesus, and they ask him if he was the son of God. And he tells them, before Abraham, I tell you, I am. So to the Bible mind, to the Bible reader, they are uh, being recalled to the story of Exodus, where Moses approaches the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, and when he tells God, who shall I say uh, sent me to the people of Israel? And the, uh, the Lord, through the burning bush, responds, tell them, I am. I am. This is not Jesus just uttering a phrase, hey guys, it's me. This is Jesus saying, I am Yahweh himself, the Lord of lords, the kings, uh, the king of kings. This is him. And he says, do not be afraid. If, you, if you're looking to survive the new year, you need to learn to develop a trust for God's word. Because when God's word is trusted, it doesn't matter what storm you're in, what adversity you face, what despair rises even from within, that word will come to fruition. See, the text says, they immediately arrived at the land they were going. You see, you don't need Greek for this. John uses the word immediately very seldomly in his, in his gospel. John is, is trying to paint a beautiful picture, and he doesn't rush through the story. Mark, if you, if Mark is a pretty uh, interesting guy. He skips Christmas. He doesn't even give you details. I mean, you have to be uh, a bad dude to skip over that story. <laughs> he, he just skips over entirely. And Mark is trying to get to the last week of Jesus' life. So if you read through Mark, every chapter you'll find Jesus did this and immediately he went there. After the healing, immediately he left town. They went on the road, immediately they did this. Mark is rushing through the story. John doesn't do that. John doesn't rush. He's very slow. He's uh, doing something very unique. He's, he's, he's an artist, and he's painting. He's composing. And there in the text, out of nowhere, he says, immediately, 
the boat arrives at its destination. This is an adjective you have to be, uh, a word you have to be uh, aware of. You have to pay close attention because John is trying to draw your mind to the miracle of arriving to the place where we're going. He's trying to let you know that when Jesus is in the boat, through the storm, you can arrive at your destination. Immediately. And where were they going? Church, where were they going? What does the text say? Capernaum. You know what Capernaum means? You know what that word means? Village of peace. Village of peace. How many know that there is a place of peace we are headed to? <laughs> There's a place of peace that we are headed to. And we are setting sail. And if we have Jesus in our boat, nothing can deter us from arriving at that destination. Pray with me, church. Father God, we put our new year into your hands. Though trial and tribulation may come, and they will come, Lord, we trust you for your word because we know that your word is true and that all promises in Jesus Christ are yes and amen. Father, we have families here, we have individuals here that are seeking some kind of transformation in this year. We have goals in mind, we have strategies that we have put together, but Lord, what are they without you in control? So Father, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you can commandeer our ship and take us home. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor, for that time of message. What do you say? Thank you very much. Pray that the Lord will be with us as we go through this year. We can use some of the tips to survive this year. We're going to sing to close our service this midday hour number two. Hit number two. All creatures of our Lord and King, lift up your voice with us and sing. Number two. Let's all stand together.